the cost of addressing climate change is going up. And those costs are hurting the small island developing states. There is a need for new technologies, infrastructure and skills to tackle climate change in vulnerable regions. But because they can't afford it, they have to rely on public and private sources for climate finance to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to implement measures to adapt to the changing environment. Developed countries have pledged big monies to help the developing states. So at COP24, finance negotiators want to map out how those monies will move between the developed and developing countries. So in a discussion on finance, we are looking at a technical level on accounting modalities where we can track financial flows from developed to developing countries. And that is really um, at the heart of the discussion presently. It's not about defining any particular goal at this point in time. Um, we have on the table a $100 billion goal per annum um, through to 2025. Uh, we've tried to get the developed countries to agree to start a process to define that, um, but they're at, at present hesitant to do that. So really what we want to get at is the, the question, are you delivering on the commitment that you made to us? But why are developed countries slow in ironing out these issues? With respect to the tracking of finance flows, they're very careful about how much they expose themselves in terms of um, the, the delivery of finance. And each one has their own um, particular concerns. Um, so the modalities have to be crafted in a way where they each one of them feels comfortable that they won't expose themselves. Um, that's one thing. The second thing is that with the Paris Agreement, one of the nuances in that agreement that's different from the convention, the framework convention, is that now we have a commitment that we should all be shifting finance flows towards low carbon, climate resilient pathways. All, meaning developed and developing country parties. So they do not want to engage on any discussion on a collective goal if they cannot discuss the donor base. And of course, emerging economies, high income economies that are developing countries are hesitant and rightly so to now decide that they will also be a part of this goal setting exercise. And that is at the crux of the matter. And because of these issues, SIDS have found themselves in a tight spot. Felsen says the SIDS being one of the regions most in need of climate financing only receives 2% of the available funding. And if parties cannot address these issues and find a common way forward, it will be those who are most affected by climate change to suffer the consequences. I think things will continue the way they are. Um, the recent report on the overview of climate finance shows that small island developing states only receive 2% of bilateral funding, 2%. And we are recognized as the ones who should be prioritized in the context of any type of bilateral financing. Um, so the loss actually would be for us not to be able to say, look, we are, uh, you are committed to prioritize us in, in relation to um, grant-based sources of, um, public sources of grant-based financing, um, and we're, we're, the figures aren't matching up. We're no longer able to, to bring that to their attention so that we could reset how they're actually focusing their bilateral financing. Um, I think that's a loss for us. Another critical topic for discussion on the issue of finance is a loss and damage mechanism in developing countries. This was established at COP19 to address loss and damage that are associated with the impact of climate change. Felsen says that they now want to know if countries will be making commitments to this mechanism. Reporting for News 5, I'm Andrea Polanco.